Hello everybody, no on track action this week but there's still plenty of news to discuss as the 2024 Formula 2 calendar is revealed. This is the F2 show by Inside F2, I'm your host Fraser Ford and joining me in this mini news at Roundup on the F2 show is motorsport journalist Lawrence Griffin. Lawrence, haven't had you on the podcast over the last couple of rounds due to personal com- commitments. I, uh, I heard you were filming the uh, latest version of uh, Naked Attraction, but anyway, we'll dismiss those uh, rumours. Uh, how have you uh, yeah, thought, felt about the last few rounds, obviously, and how they played out? Teo Porcho, our new uh, championship leader. Yeah, well, well, thank you for that introduction, Fraser. It's uh, mightily appreciated. Um, yeah, unbelievable last few rounds and just the, the turnaround that you're seeing in the championship. You know, Fred Vesti going from someone who looked like he could do no wrong, you know, he had a bit of misfortune, you know, first in, in Austria when he, he could have gone better with him for the with the safety car. And then, you know, suddenly it's just been one thing after the after another for him. And, you know, now not only is Teo Pocher taking the title, it's that he's taking the title lead at the moment, but you've got the likes of Jack Doohan suddenly back in contention. And after the first few rounds that he had, I don't think anyone thought we'd be saying that. So it's it's just fantastic to see you know, the, the title battle really hotting up now because it looked at one point like it w- might be a two-horse race. Um, but we should have known, really, that it wasn't going to be that simple. And, yeah, it's great to see how these, you know, these final three rounds are going to play out now. Absolutely. Who's your favourite from here on in? Oh, I'm. It's the, it's the dull choice to go with the person who's leading the title. Um, but I do think Teo, Teo Pocher, with his with his experience, will be able to to do the business and finish off the season in style. But, you know, you couldn't count out Jack Doohan with the sort of confidence he seems to be driving with right now. And, you know, just a, little, a few little things starting to go his way, you know, like we saw in, in Spa. So, yeah, hard to count him out. And, you know, obviously you've, you've got the likes of Oasa and obviously Fred Vesti in there still. But I'd have to go with Porcher. Yeah, ridiculous almost to sit to, you know, Jack doing 38 points behind from where he was in like the Monza, uh, Spielberg kind of, uh, sorry, Monza, Monaco, uh, Spielberg kind of area of the season. And uh, yeah, to think he is uh, only 38 points off the championship lead now is ridiculous. By the way, Lawrence, uh, who was your preseason pick? I uh, can't remember who it was. Who, who was it? It was, it was a Yumi Wasa who, as I, <laughs> as I look, as I look now, is, is, is only 34 points off the, off the championship lead. So, well, you know, the jury's still out on that one. Um, you know, who knows? You know, I would, I, I wasn't, I wasn't one to, to, to gloat early on in the season when Wasa was, was leading, nor will I despair just yet that he's, that he's a little, little bit behind. We'll have to, we'll have to wait and see on that. Yeah, all to play for from now until the end of the season, three rounds remaining. Okay, the 2024 calendar was revealed this week. Let's take a look at it as a reminder. The longest season in second tier history kicks off with a visit to Bahrain on the weekend of the 1st and the 2nd of March, meaning we'll see cars on track in qualifying as early as February the 29th. We then retain a relatively similar order uh, to this season, visiting Jeddah, Melbourne, Imola, Monaco, Barcelona and Spielberg through the months of March, April, May and June. Formula 2 then returns to Silverstone at the start of July, ahead of Budapest and Spa before the summer break. And it's then we'll start to see a slight change whereby we won't be going to Zandvoort in 2024. Monza will be the first race after the summer break, followed by Baku, which moves from April to September. And Formula 2 will then go to La Salle in Qatar for the first time, a week before the season finale in Abu Dhabi on the 8th of December. A lot to digest there, Lawrence. Uh, I guess first of all, the, uh, the 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 first point is that you know we could be qualifying on we will we will be qualifying on the 29th of February. Uh, yeah, it seems crazy to think that we'll be uh, yeah cars on track in competitive action in February, and obviously the last race of the season as well is taking place on the 8th of December. Yeah, on the 8th of December. That is right. I doubt of myself for a second there. Uh, that is one hell of a long season, isn't it? It is. It's a. It's a massive, massive season. You know, it. Ju- it just keeps getting longer every every year. You know, every year there's talks about. You know, you'll hear Stefan de Mercali talk about expanding the calendar or how many races it could be, which is always greeted by, you know, the shock and horror by everyone involved. Sort of saying, please, God, let us have us have a holiday or see our families occasionally. You know, these people are on the road all the time. But you know, it's it's great that we get more action. But it, that is a that is a long 
season, you know, and we'll, we'll, you know, we'll always talk about the calendar and talk about some of the gaps that are involved in it. You know, if you could have, I think if you could take a, take a slightly longer break over the winter, maybe the drivers would enjoy that potentially as well, have that longer break. And then once they do get back into the season, having the rounds squished together a little bit more because you're still getting a couple of, you know, a few breaks of about a month in there. Um, so, you know, it seems almost a necessary stretch. But obviously, there are so many things, so many logistical considerations, especially when you're trying to be an F1 support race and going with where, where F1 goes. Um, but yeah, it's an intriguing calendar, as as always, um, So, which I'm sure we're about to dive into a little bit more. Yeah, of course it is. The I guess the big talking point is Lasell obviously replacing Zan. What are your thoughts on uh, on Formula Two going to Qatar? It's it's really interesting as a as a circuit because I don't think there's a circuit quite like Lasale out there. You know, full of you know big high speed corners, really wide. You could get some unbelievable DRS trains around that circuit, and you know people going you know. F2 drivers go three, four wide at narrow circuits, let alone at LaSalle. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll find some way of, of doing some crazy maneuvers, especially, you know, if tire wear comes into it late on in a feature race and you've got people on alternative strategies trying to come back through the field. I think it'll be a really, really exciting race to watch. And, you know, such a, such a different circuit to the one that we're losing, which is Zandvoort, of course. Yeah, no, it's really it's really interesting, isn't it? And uh, for me, the biggest thing is that it breaks up the gap slightly, slightly between uh, the... Uh, we've always had Monza in September and we've had Abu Dhabi in December. Well, November, late November, December. And um, it's always been a big frustration of mine personally that we go 12 weeks. We're doing it this year, 12 weeks without racing, which is obviously a long, long gap. Uh, there's two races in between Monza and Abu Dhabi in 2024. The first one being Baku in mid-September, which I think is a, is a real positive. Uh, and then also La Salle um, the week before uh, Abu Dhabi it is still a little bit of a, a gap between um, between Baku and La Salle. But it breaks it up nicely uh, and yeah well i, I guess lawrence it, um as you say there, there, there is still uh, a little bit of a gap but yeah it, it, it just means that the driver's a little bit sharper because you know 12 weeks is a long time not to go racing right yeah it's it's a, it's a really really long time not to go racing i don't think anyone involved is particularly happy with with having that size of a gap so it is nice that they will break it up it also means that you know we have this real crescendo at the end of the season you know we will have a little break going into the final two rounds then you know all of a sudden i mean we've seen how quickly someone like jack Dewan can get back into contention i mean you look at the championship standings as they are and you think if you know you had a you know a sort of 50 point swing across the two rounds to one driver who just nails it and wins both feature races you know even taking out sprint race points and and, and pole position points that could have a massive, massive effect on the on the title, um, and so I think that the attraction of going into the final few weeks of the championship and really not knowing what's going to happen because you've got two rounds that could swing it either way, rather than just having the one round. You know, if you had a, a someone already crowned champion way before then, like we had last year, you know, it does take away from the drama very slightly. So. I, I think it would be nice having that double header right at the end and also cutting down that gap just a, a little bit as well. Contradicting that, um, is it, I mean, obviously two rounds at the end of the season, there's a lot of points up for grabs. Could you potentially see, um, you know, a driver who's third in the title, for example, win the final two rounds of the season and end up winning the championship? But obviously, you know, the, the Formula One market with how that works, uh, you know, it's, it's most of the seats were wrapped up by October time. Uh, October, November. Could you see a driver who's third in the standings, maybe hasn't had the best of seasons up to that point, do really well in the last two rounds of the season, win the championship, but end up without an F1 seat because of the last two rounds of the season being almost too late when the, the Formula One jigsaw puzzle of uh, seats all falls into place? What? Yeah, what do you think of that? Yeah, it's it's a real it's a real issue that you know it it makes it even harder for these drivers to crack into into F1. You know, we've seen some of the talent that's come through in recent years that hasn't made it directly into Formula One. You know, the idea that, you know, we mention it all the time, Oscar Piastri, you know, winning, you know, Formula Renault, F3, F2 in a row, and then not, that not leading directly into Formula One is, is, is just criminal. It really is. Um, but that is the way that the F1 driver market is. 
And yeah, it does make it harder for the drivers that they can't show off their talents until right at the end of the season. I think this would have been an issue even without those two rounds. Um, but yeah, if you could have placed a round sort of earlier, that that would help. But yeah, it's, it's always, even if you just had the single round at the end, you could still have quite a different looking outcome. Um, I think you've got to just trust that the team bosses involved, you know, the likes of, you know, the people involved in the Alpine junior team will see, you know, the quality of someone like Jack Doohan. And they would have been, you know, they would have trusted in that even before the last few rounds. But you're only ever as good as your last performance. And I'm sure that, you know, somewhere there are people having very different conversations about Jack Doohan now than they were a couple of months ago. Because that is that is just the way that the, the sport is. It's brutal. Um, so I think that does, I think you're absolutely right. That does close a bit of a window for them to impress the, the team bosses. Um, and that, yeah, that is something that they are going to have to have to look at because like you say, rarely are seats filled that late in the season, but it's a really tricky one to know how to, how to resolve that, how to make it fairer for the drivers. Absolutely. One more on this topic then. Um, obviously, we've gone to, or we're going to Qatar for the first time. Uh, that being said, hypothetically, if you're in charge of the Formula 2 calendar, Lawrence, and you had to pick one new venue to go to, where would it be? Would it have been Qatar? Would it have been, uh, I mean, for me, it would have been probably Cota or Brazil. I'd have loved to have gone to, to, to Sao Paulo, for example. Uh, yeah, what, what track would you have chosen to, for Formula 2 to go to for the first time? You take, you take the words right out of my, my mouth. <laughs> I was thinking about this earlier, and I just thought the idea of F2 cars round into Lagos I think would just be absolutely, absolutely brilliant because you know that they're just going to go and find overtakes in the middle sector that we just never, that we just never ever see, and you know even even into the into the penultimate corner, into the last proper corner before the the drag up the hill, into the first bend through the chicane down into turn four, you just know how much drama you're going to get there, and I think it would really com- it combines a circuit that is such a good one to race and, and to watch and a really historic circuit a really big part of 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 formula one sort of heritage there i think i think it would be fantastic to to see f2 go there i think that would be my my, my number one pick to be honest absolutely maybe we'll see that one year we never know but we'll have to uh, stick to playing that on the f1 game for the time being formula two cars around uh into lagos uh, okay that's the calendar then uh, something else i wanted to talk about it's been announced that frederick vesti will drive for mercedes in fp1 in mexico in october uh, a great opportunity for him to showcase himself in formula one machinery isn't it lawrence yeah absolutely and I think just for a driver's own personal development to get in an F1 car, to to chat to some of the team personnel, to sort of go through that process of how you set up the car and how you work with the team, I think it's just massive, um, you know, a massive value to them. And also for the teams to get to know them, see how they work. You can only learn a certain amount about a driver, I think, until you actually are going to work with them in in that team environment. And so for Mercedes to see that and to get some sort of real sort of accurate and sort of comparable data between Vesti and their current drivers and for us to see how he fares as well and see how he measures up to to people in F1 to see how he sort of um, manages that challenge of jumping in an F1 car and really not having long, you know, one practice session to, to go out and impress, to get to grips with it. I think that'll be that'll be really good to see. It's really important, as, as we've talked about in terms of the calendar, for the drivers to put themselves in the shop window. And you know, after all, this is why you're part of a of a of a junior team. It's because you want to get into F1, and you know what better way to make to bridge into that gap than to actually be driving in a, an F1 car. So yeah, really delighted for for Fred Vesti. I think it'll be a great opportunity for him, and we've seen it. For drivers in previous rounds, I remember Liam Lawson last year when he was um, he was uh, testing while well, he was driving an FP1 in Spa, and it just seemed to give him a, an extra sort of boost, a little sp- spring in his stride the whole weekend, and 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 drove pretty well as a, as a result. So, you know, hopefully that can do the same for for Fred Vesti now. You know, he's gone from 
you know, not having a terrible season last year, but not performing to the same way he is this year, to, you know, suddenly being in title contention, getting an F1 drive, you know, that will make him feel really good about about this year. And, and I'm sure it's something he's going to be really looking forward to. Yeah, absolutely. Can we see uh, anyone else from Formula 2 jumping in an FP1 uh, from here to now to the end of the season? Um, can you see Terry Porcher and an Alfa Romeo Sauber potentially? Uh, what, are your, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think Teo Porcher and Alfa Romeo is, a, is an obvious one. You know, he's been around in that in that team for, for long enough. Um, he should be getting that sort of opportunity. Um, and he's performing well enough in F2 and he really does want to be in an F1 car full time next season. Um, I also think, you know, you don't have to look much further than the Red Bull Junior driver pro project to to see, you know, people who are going to be testing. Um, I think probably Ayumu Uwasa um, could be going in and doing an Alpha Tower retest. Um, I mentioned Liam Lawson there. He's probably likely to be to be testing for for Red Bull as a, as their Red as Red Bull's test driver. I expect him to get a run out, and you know he's been impressing so much in in Super Formula. Um, and you know he's another one that's in the conversation for the whole Red Bull seat situation. You've got Danny Rick there. You've got You've got Sonoda, you've got the whole question mark over Sergio Perez at the moment. If is is if is Daniel Ricciardo going to move up there? Sorry, I've opened up a whole can of worms. With that's a whole new podcast, Lawrence. That's, that's a whole, that's a whole podcast. separate podcast. But anyway, there should be opportunities there for someone like Oasta to jump into an Alpha Tauri for sure. Um, I'd I'd really like to see that happen. And you know, why not see some of the Ferrari Driver Academy drivers? You know, getting into the likes of a of a Haas or, or an Alfa Romeo, you know, imagine someone like Ollie Behrman, you know, as young as he is, getting that that run out, you know. It'd really be nice to see some of those drivers getting rewarded for their performance with a chance to to be in that F one team for a weekend. I'd I would i would love to see that personally. Yeah, I agree with you. I think we could well see a few of those Oasa in an Alpha Tower definitely. I think we could see Porsche in a an Alfa Romeo, uh, Jack Dewan in an Alpine and Oli Berman in a Haas would be pretty cool as well, wouldn't it? So let's wait and see. Best of luck to Frederick Vesti whilst he uh, obviously takes part in FP1 in uh, in Mexico. Uh, and as a reminder as well um, of our latest giveaway, you can win a Frederick Vesti or an Oli Berman signed driver card. For more details on how to win one of those, go to our latest episode of the F2 show, Doing Deja Vu, where we reviewed the Spa weekend. There's more details on how to win those driver cards in that podcast. Good luck. Okay, that's all we've got time for today on this short episode of the podcast. From me, Fraser Ford, and all of us here at Inside F2, we'll see you next time.